Last month, I made a video talking about Clipper firmware, primarily going over the reasons why I've really enjoyed using it. In that video, I mentioned that Clipper is primarily meant to be ran on a Raspberry Pi and received a couple of comments from viewers letting me know they're actually running Clipper on a laptop or desktop PC and that they think that is a really good way of also running Clipper. Although I still don't find it nearly as convenient, especially for portability, when I was at Murph, I was talking to my buddy Gfunny and he let me know that at home, he's got one PC that he's using to control three or four different clippered printers. This was really interesting to me because I have quite a few printers that are sitting on a rack that don't really ever move. When I got home from Murph, I went through our stash of retired laptops that I've just taken with me everywhere we moved, and I found a T420 that has an i5 processor and eight gigs of RAM that I felt would be a perfect computer, a perfect laptop to turn sort of into a clipper box. In today's video, we'll cover how to use a laptop or desktop that might be collecting dust as a way to control one or multiple clipper printers. For some, this might actually be a much better solution than going out and buying an overpriced Raspberry Pi, especially if you already have the hardware just sitting around. So with all that being said, and without further ado, let's get right into today's video. As far as things you need, we will need a laptop or desktop that we'll be able to install Linux onto. And then we'll also need a flash drive, or in my case, a micro SD card to USB adapter that we can download the Linux image file onto that we can then install on our laptop or desktop. For those interested, the official Clipper website does have some documentation on how to run Clipper on a device other than a Raspberry Pi. So for those interested, I will have that linked in the description. Since Clipper is typically built to run on a Raspberry Pi, which is running a Raspbian operating system, which is based off of Debian Linux, we're going to want to install a flavor of Debian Linux onto our computer to make compatibility as easy as possible. There are quite a few options available, so if you're already familiar with Linux, feel free to use your preferred distro. I decided to go with Linux Mint, and I can verify that Linux Mint has worked very well for me. The first thing we need to do is download Linux Mint. If we head over to the downloads page, there's actually quite a few different options. I opted for the XFCE edition, which is a very stable and lightweight version of the operating system, which is exactly what we want. We don't want it to be resource intensive. We're just going to set up Clipper and let it run. On the downloads page, you have the option to either download it via a torrent link or there's a bunch of mirror download options. So I just chose a server based in the United States and downloaded the ISO file. Aside from the ISO, we'll also need a piece of software to flash the image file to our flash drive. Belina Etcher is the primary one that I've used for a really long time. So if you head over to their website, you can download this for your operating system. I'll have both Linux Mint as well as the Belina Etcher tool in the description. So you can click on it and it'll take you right to their website, but get it installed like any other program you would. As soon as the Linux ISO has finished downloading, we'll open up the Belina Etcher program and we'll click on the flash from file button. This will open up a finder or file explorer window where we'll navigate to that ISO we just downloaded and click open. Next, if you have not already, plug in your flash drive or memory card and then click on the select target option. This will display all of your hard drives or storage drives and make sure you click the correct one because as soon as we click this flash button on Mac, it will ask you for your password. I don't believe it does on Windows. It's going to format whatever it is that you're flashing. So if you accidentally format a secondary hard drive, that is very bad. So just double check and make sure before you click continue that you've selected the correct device. Depending on your flash drive, the flashing process and then the validating process can take anywhere from one minute to 10 minutes. So just sit tight and as long as you see this flash complete screen at the end, you are good to go. Next, we will take our flash drive that has the Linux image flashed onto it. We'll plug it into our computer and we will turn on our computer. We'll need to boot into BIOS, which is very different depending on what computer, what motherboard you're using. So my recommendation is probably to search your specific model of computer if you've never booted into BIOS before, but it typically involves turning on the computer and then quickly pressing a certain button on the keyboard to get into this BIOS menu. 
Once you've gotten into the BIOS menu, we need to head over to the startup or boot menu. The way most computers work is, is that when you turn them on, they are going to boot up from the hard drive and we need to change that. We need to make it where it's going to boot from our flash drive before it boots into Windows or whatever other operating system you've currently been running. Each BIOS will look slightly different, but in my case, the USB hard drive mass storage device is what it's calling my flash drive. And I'm just using the plus and minus keys on the keyboard to raise its priority up to the very top. Once complete, I'm going to click escape and then enter to save my configuration. The computer will then reboot and now it will boot into the flash drive instead of booting into the hard drive. Once it boots into the flash drive, you'll have this menu and we'll just hit enter on Start Linux Mint to boot into the Linux Mint operating system. I ended up going with a much better flash drive than the one I showed initially because the micro SD card took forever to boot or to load. So using a high quality flash drive is something I also highly recommend. Once it's booted into the desktop, click on the install Linux Mint icon that is a picture of a disk and it will pop up the install window. From here, you're just going to follow all of the on-screen prompts, which are where are you region-wise, you'll want to log into your Wi-Fi network if you're not plugged in via Ethernet, and then it gives you the option to install multimedia codecs. It's totally optional, I opted to install that. When you get to installation type, yours might look slightly different because it did have Linux Mint previously installed, but the setting you're going to want to choose is erase disk and install Linux Mint. We want to overwrite the Windows install or whatever install we have on our main hard drive with Linux Mint. And then it will give you a little warning, just letting you know that it's going to be overriding the disk or the partitions that are there, and you will need to click continue. Next, we'll need to set the username and computer's name. You can use whatever you want. For simplicity's sake, for this tutorial, I just went with user and we're calling the computer clipper. But again, you can use whatever you want. We will be using this information later to log into our computer. As far as passwords go, also just use whatever password you want. And I recommend setting it to log in automatically. Make sure you remember the user and password because we will be using that for pseudo permissions as well as to SSH later on. Once the installation process starts, it will take at least a few minutes, and a lot of this also varies depending on the flash drive you went with. But when it's complete, it will let you know, and we'll want to click the Restart Now button and unplug the flash drive. If everything goes well, it should boot into Linux now, and this is now booting into Linux off of your hard drive since the flash drive is no longer plugged in, and we also won't see the Install Linux Mint icon on our desktop. The first thing we'll want to do is enable SSH so that way we can remotely connect into this laptop. I will link to this website that has the commands needed or you can just copy the commands based off what you see on screen. But on our Linux computer, all we're going to do is open up a terminal and copy these couple of commands on this website, which is sudo apt update. And then you will need to type in your password that you created just a moment ago. Once that's completed, we'll type sudo apt install and then the open ssh dash server. Again, just copy exactly like you see on screen. This will take a moment to install. And then I also recommend running the last command, which is the sudo system ctl status ssh. And all this last one is doing is it will give you a visual confirmation that this has installed successfully and that you will now be able to SSH into this computer. So next to active, we can see active running in green and we are good to go. With that out of the way, we are ready to install Kaya or the Clipper installation and update helper. I will have this also linked down below in the description so that way you can just click on it and follow the steps outlined on the GitHub. Just like we did a moment ago, we're going to copy the commands that are in the GitHub instructions and we're going to paste them into the terminal. To download the script, you need to have git installed and since this is a fresh install, we don't have that yet. The sudo apt get install git command will install that and you will once again need to type in the password we created just a moment ago. And once that's done, just copy the three lines that are below in the instructions, which is the line with cd, then the git clone line. Uh, you can copy and paste this in. And the final one is the kai.sh script, which will actually run the script and you'll be greeted with this terminal or command line interface. 
This menu will have information on the right. As we can see, nothing is installed. And on the left, we have the numeric value for the different actions we can perform. Since nothing is done so far, we need to type in the number one and hit enter, which will take us into the install menu. And we're going to start by installing Clipper. So we'll type the number one, hit enter, and then we'll type the number one one more time to install Python 2.7. Now it's gonna ask you how many Clipper instances you'd like to set up. The answer to this question will depend on how many printers you're trying to run and hardware limitations as well. I actually reached out to the main sale team to see if I can get an answer as far as what the requirements are roughly to run a clipper machine. And the answer I got was that it depends heavily on what sort of printer you're running, how many motors, does it have a camera, are you going to be running ADXLs for input shaper? So the answer is it depends and it will take some experimentation and everyone's sort of situation will be unique. In my case, I've got a computer with an i5 processor and eight gigs of RAM. So I decided I will try to run four instances of Clipper. Once you hit enter, it will confirm that you want the four instances or however many instances you want. Hitting enter will choose yes, and then it'll give you the option to create custom names. I hit enter, which is for no. You can add the custom names later. I don't know what all printers I'll be using, so I didn't want to name four different machines right now. Then it will install however many instances of Clipper you chose. At some point, it will ask if you want to add your current user into the group. I hit enter, which is for yes. It's just for permissions later on. And I do recommend that you also select yes for this. After that, it will take you back to the original menu where now we will type the number two and hit enter to install Moonmaker. It should detect however many instances of Clipper you've got, and it will just ask you to confirm that and we'll hit enter to install the four instances of Moonraker. The Moonraker install will be fairly quick and then it will kick you back to that original menu. If we look above the menu, we can see four instances and that's the IP address for our Clipper laptop or our Clipper computer that we'll be logging into. And instead of having four IPs for the four different printers or four different Clipper installs, we have four different ports, which are 7125 through 7128. And we will be using those in just a little bit. Next, we need to install the Clipper web interface. We can choose three for main sale or four for fluid. I love main sale, so I am going to be typing in three and hitting enter, but it's really just personal preference. This will install the web interface and there will be a couple of questions. The first is to install the MJGP streamer for webcam support. I went ahead and typed in yes or Y for yes and hit enter. I don't know whether I'll be using webcams, but I'd like to have the option. And then it will also ask you if you want to use the recommended macros and the default is Y or yes. So I hit enter for that to have it automatically install those macros for me. Once complete, it will kick us back to the original menu and we're done. So I'm going to type B to go back to the main menu for the interface and then I will type Q to quit out of this. And we actually don't need to do anything else on our laptop or on our Linux PC. I'm going to hop over to just my main desktop now. From my main desktop, I'm going to type in the IP address for the Clipper laptop, which we saw a moment ago when we installed Moonraker, you can also get it off of your local router and it will take us to the main sale interface. Since we have more than one instance, we'll need to click the add printer button and it will automatically populate the first port. So we'll just type in the same IP address we just used to get here. And I recommend copying it because we'll need to do it a couple times and we'll click add printer. Mine says KP3S because I was playing around with it, but yours will just say the IP address and the port number. So we'll just keep rinsing and repeating every time we will increment the port number by one. These are the ports that we saw when we installed Moonraker earlier, but all you're going to do is add one to the previous port each time. So in my case, it was started at 7125. I did 7126, 27, and 28. And you'll just do that for however many instances of Clipper that you installed. So we now have our four printers for our four instances of Clipper. We can click on any of them. We can click on the name in the top left and you can bounce between all of them. It's basically like you've got four Raspberry Pis, but they're all within this one Clipper box or Clipper computer that we've created. And you can customize any of them because they are essentially their own entities. If 
you go into the settings menu in the top right for any of them, you can name them. So in this case, I'm just naming it Creality Ender 3. Uh, you can change the color icon if you want to sort of be able to differentiate between them. If I had not done this myself, I really wouldn't know that I wasn't just using regular Clipper on a Raspberry Pi, which is very cool. So we also can SSH into our computer or our Clipper box on Mac. You just open a terminal, type SSH space, and then the name of the user you created, which in my case was user, at, and then the IP address, which we know the IP address. We can see it in the URL. And then we'll need to type in our password that we created for our Clipper computer. Once we're logged in, we can run the same Kaya script to go back to that terminal menu that'll let us do things like update or make changes or build the Clipper files that are needed to actually flash the printer boards. At this point, all that's left is to actually flash Clipper to your printer and to either find or create the printer.cfg file. We've covered quite a bit of this in a previous video that I will have linked in the description down below. It's the Octo Clipper video that we made earlier this year. I also will have some resources down below, like the official Clipper configuration directory is a fantastic place to start to actually find a printer config file, maybe for your printer, or at least one that you can work off of that will also have these steps on how to flash your specific board. If you don't find your printer there, like for the KP3S that I flashed, the manufacturers will often put out guides or even on like the official Facebook groups for some of these printers, you can find them as well. But it is beyond the scope of this video and there is a lot more information on that out there. But if there is specific questions you have about that, please let me know in the comments down below. I hope that you enjoyed this video and that you either successfully installed Clipper on your laptop or old computer, or at least have a much better understanding of the process should you decide that's something that you want to do. The process itself is not very difficult and it's just slightly different than the way I'm used to installing Clipper, which is on a Raspberry Pi. That's what I've done on all of the Voron printers and the one or two other machines that I've been experimenting with Clipper on. On that note, don't forget to like and subscribe for more great videos. We make a video every single week, so there's always fresh content coming your way. And if you do want to support the channel furthermore, I'll place links down below in the description over to our Patreon, where there are some really awesome rewards. Huge thank you to all of our existing Patreon supporters. I appreciate each and every one of you for allowing me to come back every single week and spend more time doing what I love, which is making content for you all to enjoy. On that note, this has been Daniel from ModBot, and I look forward to seeing you guys in my next video. Peace, guys.